This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Good morning, gang. Welcome to the program. We have had a great week. I hope that you have. There are a a lot of things to do out in the landscape, even though this morning we have gotten really cold, haven't we? All of a sudden, we have gotten really cold, and, uh, you know, we knew it was coming, right? We just didn't know what day it would be. Well, now it's here. So we've got to be sure that we are doing the appropriate things in the landscape, not overdoing it, because there are certain things we don't want to do, and we've talked about it few of those over the past uh, few uh, few weeks. For instance, uh, we don't want to be pruning anything. That's the big no-no, especially now that we see uh, dangerously cold temperatures, dangerously meaning almost freezing, and we should be freezing soon enough. I didn't see the report really, but uh, it did get really cold last night. So we don't want to be out there pruning. Here's why. When we take a cut on a plant, uh, we are creating a wound, essentially, and that wound won't be able to heal. And the reason is because the plant has stopped growing. It's cold. uh, There's really very few plants, if any, that are going to be growing this time of year. This is not the growing season uh, for our our area. And so with that in mind, we don't want to have uh, these fresh cuts made that cannot heal because water can get into the stem and that can create a major problem by freezing. Freezing temperatures are not a good way to go. So we definitely want to make sure that we're not doing that. We also don't want to be fertilizing. See, fertilizing can also encourage the plant to grow. And when you encourage a plant to grow, because we have had some warm uh, uh, days and whatnot, um, you might get a little bit of growth. And if that's the case, the freezing temperatures at night will zap that growth down. Secondly, um, you uh, when you fertilize, you're kind of wasting this time of year because they're, they probably won't be using much of that at all. So with that in mind, we've got to make sure that we are not doing those kinds of things. But I will tell you one thing you should be doing. You should be planting this time of year. Trees, shrubs, most perennials, it's a great time to plant. It is a great time to plant, so you've got to get out there. you got to come visit me at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch, uh, not too far from Oakwood, just right off 985, uh, to find some beautiful shrubs, trees. Of course, we have evergreen things. Some, some plants still have leaves on them, and and some have some gorgeous fall color right now. We still have some grasses that were blooming. They were looking good yesterday. We'll see how this freeze teaches uh, t- treats them. But uh, uh, we had some pink muley grass, which is a beautiful, fine, wispy foliage with beautiful plumage as well. So anyhow, f- uh, feel free to give us a call this morning, 706-865-3181, if, if you would like to uh, have a question answered. But um, I, otherwise, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about certain things you should be doing in the landscape and uh, maybe some things you shouldn't be as we've already mentioned uh, since it's nice and cold this morning I thought that I would uh, t- talk to you talk to you a little bit about what happens when a plant to a plant when it gets cold because just like when it gets cold we start to change don't we we start to turn our heater on in the in the vehicle or in our house turn off our air conditioning we start to put on more clothes this morning Buster and I we have uh, several layers on and uh, it's nice and warm here in the studio though but uh, so things do change uh, to a changes happen to a plant when it gets cold number one what happens is uh, to hardy plants hardy plants they go dormant now I need to explain uh, what I mean by hardy. Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y, is used a lot, and maybe you've used it that word as well, and people think it means, uh, you know, a plant that's really tough. But hardy really means a plant that overwinters without uh, dying. So a plant that can handle cool very cold temperatures. Of course, we have hardiness zones, and if you go Google uh, or search on the internet for hardiness zone map, that would be the USDA hardiness zone map, you'll see that we're listed by numbers. Uh, You and I are somewhere around seven. A little bit north would be somewhere in the sixes, Um, and so that number represents a certain degree that that uh, the temperatures drop to, and plants that are listed for zone seven or um, higher or lower, I should say, seven, six, five, uh, more cold, 
those kinds of plants can be planted and they are hardy. Those kinds of plants are going dormant for the winter. And you'll see even uh, evergreen plants, they of course drop, uh, they keep their leaves, excuse me, but these evergreen plants are hardy. And so are uh, uh, deciduous plants, plants that drop their leaves, like of course oaks and dogwoods, things that you notice outside that are changing and dropping leaves. Number two, what happens to a plant when it gets cold is tropical or tender plants. They, they freeze. They freeze and die. Um, if the plant is tender, it's the opposite of hardiness. Uh, tender means it, they cannot make it through the winter time. They cannot make it through the cold temperatures in our, in our area. And so these tender plants, if they're left outside, they will die. Now, some plants may be tender uh, on their tops may be tender, but they're they're still um, hardy underground. So their root stock is is uh, hardy, and they'll potentially come back from from the ground. For instance, let's talk about banana trees. Banana trees are considered a, t uh, a tropical plant. They're considered tender. However, in our area, generally, I don't know how far north, maybe into Cleveland, but definitely, uh, definitely down. Well, you know, I was driving down the road today and still saw a good stand of uh, banana trees just off 115. So I believe that uh, most likely we're able to grow them this far. The tops are tender. They're going to die back, but down underground, down underground, the roots are hardy and they can continue to survive the cold temperatures. Now, what happens to a plant when it gets frozen out, like the tender, uh, tender tropical plants, is that the water inside of each cell begins to freeze, right? And what happens when water freezes? It expands. And once that water expands and turns to ice, it explodes the cells that are in there. So on a microscopic level, we have massive damage, massive damage, exploding cells, and those cells are now dead. Once uh, it warms up again, you're just left with this blob of mushy, green, um, nasty goo because the cells are no longer uh, intact. They are completely damaged, and that is not a good situation for your tender plants. And the last point is that's exactly what happens to plants that may be hardy, but they have new growth that's not hardened off. And that's why I don't encourage you to do any kind of fertilizing or pruning after Labor Day because new growth that wasn't able to harden off can get zapped with this cold temperature, zapped with these cold temperatures, and those cells will explode and you're left with damage. That would be called winter damage or freeze damage, and we don't want to do that. So these are the kinds of things that are happening uh, when it's getting cold. And of course, it is getting cold today. So if you are just joining us in the program, we want to let you know that uh, we there are several ways you can listen uh, to Let's Get Growing. You can, number one, of course, listen on the FM radio at 93.9 or 1350 a.m. And also, you can look back at our old shows. If you haven't seen our program before, we do have a video aspect on Facebook and YouTube. So you can go to YouTube and you can watch uh, live stream right now. Uh, we do have some folks watching, and we would encourage y'all to call in if you'd like. It's 706-865-3181. But if not, you could also type us a message uh, right there on the stream on Facebook. Just go to Facebook or YouTube and type in WRWA and you'll find all of our older shows right there and you can catch up on all this gardening goodness. And lastly, if you don't have a radio or if you're away from the radio, you can also use your smartphone. Uh, WRWH is linked to a, a TuneIn app. That's T-U-N-E-I-N, TuneIn, TuneIn, just like you're doing right now. The TuneIn app, you download it wherever you get your applications on your smartphone. Once you download TuneIn app, you will search for WRWH, and there's going to be a heart beside it, and you're going to want to press that heart because that means WRWH is your favorite. And since it already is, you might as well make it your favorite on TuneIn. So let's get connected this morning. Let's uh, talk a little bit about gardening. Let's do do some gardening stuff. If you have gardening questions, of course, you can also email them to us at info at wrwh.com. Now, I would like to mention a few topics that I didn't have time for last week. I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about native plants. Native plants are really important in the landscape. 
As a matter of fact, we have um, an event that I'll be attending this weekend, uh, this week, uh, this little fundraiser for a Linwood Nature Preserve down in Gainesville, Georgia. If you don't know about Linwood Nature Preserve, it's always open to the public uh, as long as it's not dark. It is a project of the Gainesville Park and Recs, and also it is partnered with the Redbud chapter of the Georgia Native Plant Society, which is based right there in Gainesville. And uh, we're going to be talking about native plants this week, so I thought, well, let me mention that to you. Do you know if you have any native plants in your landscape? I'll tell you what, there's probably plenty of native plants in the woods uh, behind or beside you or in front of you if you have a set of woods uh, near you. But you can also use native plants in your landscape. Number one, the reason um, you want to use native plants is because when you use native plants, you're planting for nature. You see, the plants that you'd be planting, they've adapted to our area, and they've made strong associations and strong uh, relationships with other plants and also other animals, uh, insects, pollinators, you know, butterflies, bees, things that we need to be thinking about because, as you know, folks, the bees are collapsing and we need to try to provide as much as we can for them. So with that being said, uh, native plants, they provide food for pollinators. They also provide uh, uh, food as a host plant for larvae and the young. Some, some, uh, some insects and pollinators, they only lay eggs on certain specific types of plants. For instance, probably the most well-known is the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly lays its eggs on plants that are only in the milkweed family. That would be Asclepius. So plants that are only in the milkweed family. So you've got to have certain native plants in order to provide for nature. Uh, also, what native plants can do is they can provide food and coverage for birds and other larger wildlife. Of course, we know that there are deer and whatnot. Uh, they're part of nature, and, we have to, and we've had an extensive um, discussion on that. If you want to check back on our YouTube channel, just look back for the uh, uh, deer discussion a few weeks ago. But uh, food, of course, berries and also um, some foliage for uh, other animals. But coverage in the wintertime is important, folks. When the winter comes, if we only have lawn out there, there's very little places that uh, other little critters can hibernate. So we're going to continue to talk about native plants after this quick break and be sure to hang on tight because there's a lot more to come. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on 93.9 FM WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right, welcome back to the program, folks. Uh, we have been discussing native plants. If you're just joining us, I, I hope that you have some native plants in your landscape. Uh, but if not, we've talked about some of the benefits of why you would use them. We were just finishing our discussion on talking about that uh, native plants provide coverage and food for wildlife. I, I like to put it this way when it comes to pollinators or other types of uh, animals. You know, uh, growing up here in the South, I really like fried chicken and gravy and biscuits and collard greens and turnip greens. And I could go on and on, but that kind of makes me hungry. So I'll stop that. But I really like that because I grew up with it right here uh, in, in Gaines, or right here in Northeast Georgia. And so th the thing is, is that's kind of the same for these pollinators. They have grown up and, and evolved and changed with um, nature, and and they're used to certain plants now. Uh, it's true that if we bring over some, you know, plants from other parts of the world, foreign plants, such as uh, butterfly bush, which is becoming invasive, by the way, but uh, they'll frequent it, but it does not make a host plant. Uh, it does not make a host plant for any, anything. The, 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 the number one plant that makes a host plant for um, most of our uh, insects and other pollinators is the oak tree, actually. The oak tree sustains hundreds, hundreds of specific insects, and it's just uh, quite amazing. So um, what we'd like to say last is that when we're talking about native plants, of course, they do all of these things and they also are beautiful. I mean, we have some native plants that have these unique, interesting flowers like, uh, say, button bush, um, ceanothus, which is a, a New Jersey tea, uh, beautiful little fluffy white flowers, and also great foliage. We have the broadleaf foliage of our native uh, oak leaf hydrangea. This time of year, the foliage is turning to a deep blood red, just absolutely beautiful. 
And, uh, of course, we have berries, like right now. Uh, we have beauty berry, which if you have a beauty berry, you know what kind of regalia she brings to the garden. It's absolutely gorgeous and delightful. So keep that in mind. Planting for natives and using, using native plants, planting for nature, is going to be vital, especially since we see so many subdivisions and homes coming in, destroying our landscapes, uh, not landscapes, but destroying our, our wilderness. We need to realize that we're a part of nature. We're a part of nature. Uh, Thomas Rayner, who's a, a pretty... Uh, he, He's a modern um, landscape designer. He says, in the future, nature will look more like a garden. And that's kind of what we're going to have to get to. We're going to have to realize that we are part of nature and we are in nature. This morning, if you have a question, feel free to give me a call. You can call me at 706-865-3181. Or you can always send us a message on our live Facebook stream. Just go to Facebook.com and search WRWH. And you can leave us a question there. We'd be glad to answer. But otherwise, I'd like to talk a little bit about mulches. Mulches are very important. And you definitely want to mulch plants this time of year, especially if they might be a little tender or might be um, a little susceptible to cold. Some of those plants might include banana trees, if you have banana trees, and also angel trumpets. Angel trumpets uh, will be killed on the tops uh, by this cold weather, but they will retreat underground and they could benefit from a couple of inches of mulch. Now, before we talk about different types of mulches and how that works, I would like to mention that mulches... It's kind of like an umbrella, okay? You have this word mulch, and underneath it you have things like the shredded wood, the bark, whatever. You have pine bark, and you have pine straw, and even gravel or, or rock or stone. So mulches is like an umbrella, and there are several different types of mulches you can utilize in your landscape. Now, why would you use one or the other? Well, uh, really, there's no benefit to one or the other. There, there's a few that I want to discuss, but they all do help to achieve the same goal. Uh, the goals of mulches would be to help reduce weeds because placing a layer of mulch on top of the uh, ground above weeds will help to suppress the weeds. Secondly, another reason to, to use mulch would be to moderate the temperature of the soil. Did you know that the soil can heat? We've uh, seen some, some records that the top of the soil can become extremely hot, maybe a hundred and something degrees over the course of the summer if left unmulched. You see, when you mulch, you're creating this barrier like a blanket, and it's helping to keep heat in in the wintertime and helping to keep the, with the soil cool in the summertime. So that's a very big, important, uh, in, important factor when trying to grow and cultivate plants uh, that you want to maintain a certain temperature of, of uh, soil um, right there around the base of the plant. Thirdly, you want to make sure that you're moderating soil moisture. Soil moisture can fluctuate, uh, especially if it's left exposed. I'll tell you what, folks, if you're not using mulch, you'll probably find that your plants dry out a lot quicker. I'll tell you what, if you place down two inches of mulch around the base of your plant, keeping it two inches away from the trunk, you will find that the moisture in the soil, even in the summertime, will stay uh, will, will stay pretty much there. It, it'll fluctuate depending on, on if, if we have a drought or not. But regardless, a nice mulch layer will give you a wonderful situation uh, with mulch. You'll be able to moderate that soil moisture. So those are the benefits. Now underneath this umbrella of mulches, we do have something like shredded wood, which a lot of people are using, shredded bark and whatnot. You do, with mulch, you want to have, it's called the two-by-two two rule. When you spread it, I've already alluded, but you want to spread it two inches thick, and you want to keep it two inches away from the trunk of the tree or the, the shrub. Why would you want to keep it two inches away from the trunk of the tree? Because if it's right around the base of the tree, right there, um, touching the uh, trunk, moisture can build up around the base of the tree. It can cause rot around the crown right there at the, um, uh, the root flare. And your plant can become girdled and it can die. And I have seen that situation happen a lot of times. The same happens if you plant the plant too deeply and put soil around the base of the plant. The tree, no matter how much moisture there is, doesn't matter because you're girdling the plant. You're wrapping a tight um, group of moisture around there causing rot right at the base. And, of course, like I mentioned, it's a two-by-two two rule, so you want to spread it two inches thick. Why do you want to spread it two inches thick? Because primarily, uh, two inches, in the research has shown, is the appropriate amount for most beneficial and not becoming detrimental. Too little can be detrimental and too much can be detrimental. Right there at two inches is, is absolutely um, perfect for what you want to do. Now, the other type of... Um, 
mulch that is very common in the landscape is called pine straw, which, of course, are the leaves from pine trees that has fallen. It's collected primarily in those uh, uh, woodland forests that have been planted for pine for lumber in middle and south Georgia and maybe some up here in north Georgia. But uh, they collect it. They send it our way. You apply it to your, your, your area. Now, the main difference with pine straw when spreading this is that you do want to spread it four inches thick. You spread it four inches thick because it's nice and fluffy when you spread it. But over time, it settles down to two inches. So if you spread it at four inches thick, uh, air will be pushed out of it over time. Um, um, rain will beat it down and flatten it down to two inches. So you still have that two by two rule, um, but you just start off with four inches thick. Now, the, di- the main difference, uh, horticulturally speaking, between shredded wood and pine straw is this. You see, shredded wood is made up of a, a lot of carbon, which is good for the soil. Carbon is good for the soil. There is some nitrogen in it, but it's mainly going to be made of carbon. <clears throat> now, carbon helps to build soil faster. So if you're applying wood mulch, shredded mulch, you'll find that this high carbon content will slowly break down by microbes in the soil and by earthworms and whatnot, and you will be left with a wonderful built soil. It's like adding compost, but it's slowly releasing over time. Now, pine straw, on the other hand, doesn't have as much carbon because it's leaf material. Leaf materials have more nitrogen. Yes, there's some carbon there, but not nearly as much as in the shredded bind, uh, shredded wood. So whenever you're using pine straw, it doesn't really build the soil quite as fast. You know, we do tend to spread it pretty thick, which helps uh, build the soil. But if you're looking to help build your soil, you may want to consider using more shredded wood rather than pine straw, which is essentially just leaves. But of course, with either direction you want to take, um, you're going to be building your soil. You've always got to have mulch. Whatever your heart desires, you can utilize. That's the number one th- uh, answer I give when people ask me at the nursery, at Lanier Nursery and Gardens, where I work in Flowery Branch. Uh, they say, which mulch is better? What, what's better? Pine straw? I see a lot of people doing pine straw. Is that better? I say, not necessarily. And I go through what I just discussed with you. And I say, okay, so take your choice, whatever you like, whatever looks best, go for it. Um, but the reality is, is you've got to have mulch. You've got to have mulch and you've got to make sure you do some pretty soon if you have been uh, lax about getting it out there. So that is a good discussion on mulch. Oh, I forgot to mention about um, things such as gravel. If you want to use gravel, you surely can. It does t- the gravel stone it, it does tend to hold on to a bit of moisture so you I'm not moisture I'm sorry heat it holds on to a good bit of heat um, so that's that's the uh, the idea there is the, it does tend to be cool underground, but it still keeps the, the base of the plant pretty warm. It doesn't seem to do too much uh, detriment, but it does work. Um, and as a matter of fact, I probably should mention, now that I'm thinking about it, I should mention about those those either plastic or fibers that people put down on top of the soil. Those kinds of fibers and whatnot that you put underneath your mulch, they don't really work unless you use something like pine straw or gravel. Um, and, and when you use pine straw, every year you need to pull the pine straw off the top of those fabrics. Because see, what happens is weeds will grow into the pine straw or into the mulch on top of the fabric, and they'll they'll make holes. Their roots will penetrate the plastic, penetrate the pine straw, uh, not the pine straw, penetrate the, uh, the the fabric, and what you're left with is holes that weeds from underground can grow through. So they don't really work uh, like we think they should. Now they would work with pine straw, like I said, but you've got to remove the pine straw and and put fresh out every year. You don't want to build a layer of organic matter that these uh, weed seeds can can grow in because weeds. Seeds are going to blow in, folks. They're going to blow in from your neighbors. They're going to blow in from the little buffer in between you and your neighbor. They're going to blow in from the woods wherever. Um, they're going to blow in from the DOT property across the street, wherever it may be. Uh, they're going to have weeds. And so you've got to prevent them from growing in that organic matter. Now, <clears throat> the gravel, on the other hand, would work uh, with a fabric or a plastic underneath. Because it's less likely to grow in larger stone. The smaller the stone, the more moisture that can be held, the more nutrients that can be held, uh, and weeds could take off. But if you're using something like a larger pebble, larger stone, you're going to find that you're going to get um, probably a better results that way. You're probably going to get better results that way. But uh, I don't normally recommend. did some research when I was at the uh, U- University of Georgia in horticulture, and we just found that uh, those 
kinds of products. They just don't work. If you must, you have you, you can, but uh, they just really don't work. So keep that in mind. Uh, before we go to break, I want to mention um, that this week at the nursery, we have some beautiful native plants. We have some beautiful uh, plants that are evergreen and whatnot. So definitely come, come down and see me this weekend. I'll be there till four o'clock today. That's Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Oakwood, Georgia. But if you can't make it there, just hold on tight and we'll be back with more gardening goodness right, right in a few moments. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on 93.9 FM WRWH. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. So we've just been discussing, 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 <laughs> the discussion about a lot of different things in the garden and the landscape, and we're having a really good time up here. Uh, we've just finished talking about mulches, which is important, but something that's just as important as mulch is also manure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, manure is very important in the landscape. <clears throat> Buster, I'm having a problem here. <clears throat> we need to get you a cough button. I'm going to need a cough button. I didn't know they made those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a cough button would be great. Okay. So I, I told Buster I'm going to uh, let him chime in here because we're going to talk about manure. And uh, I, um, I I wondered if, if Buster has ever stepped in manure or a cow patty or anything like that. Come on now. Have you? Come on Have now. you? Every form of manure I feel like I've stepped in a pile of it at some point. <laughs> yeah. Literal, metaphorical, you know, whatever. Yeah, right. I've okay. stepped so you in have. It. So you're familiar with this stuff called manure. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, just last night I told my uncle, I said, I'm going to use his little joke. He says, um, uh, make sure you don't step in manure because... Um, It'll grow your toenails. That's how potent manure is. It will grow your toenails. And uh, we'll talk about manure in a minute, but I I do want to tell you the story. Um, When I was a kid, um, my cousin's grandmother and grandfather, they have this farm over uh, um, near North Hall. And uh, we would go over there in the summer, and we would have a lot of fun as kids because they had like three pastures full of cows. Uh, well, at least they would rotate it, you know. And so there was their house on a hill and then this lower pasture where they would uh, let, let the cows roam. Now, it had just rained the day before, and it was super wet out there. But we got out there, and there was this bull, and me <laughs> and my cousin were uh, kind of— Touting, touting the bull. We were trying taunting. to kind of taunting. That's the yeah. wrong thing. Taunting the bull, taunting the bull, and we were kind of you know thinking we were big and bad. Well, then the bull appeared to come our way. Now we're not really sure if it did, but as like seven and eight year old or however old we were, uh, we really thought it that looked bull, at you it funny, looked, and that's all it needed to do. <laughs> that's all it needed to do. <laughs> it was really about to rear up at us, and so we took off. And like I mentioned, it had just rained the day before. Well, there was this little kind of stream, and we were headed towards that area, and there was this low, saggy spot where these steps were that took us back to the house. Mm -hmm. So we were running, and we marred up in this mud, which we thought was mud. Um, (laughs) It was about uh, knee-deep, maybe waist-deep. We were trying to trudge through this, and boy, we were having trouble. And uh, we looked back, and, you know, the bull was just kind of chilling there. He didn't really, really wasn't interested in us, but we really thought he was. We were scared as as all get out but the the worst part of the story was was not you know trudging through this thick the worst manure. part of the story is i actually ate breakfast this morning and this is what you this is what you wanted to discuss this is what you wanted to invite me in on i'm sorry about that we'll have to hold the cheerios if you can but uh the worst part of the story was we made it to the top of the hill where the house was and it wasn't the angry bull that was such a problem it was grandma because when we came back with our shoes nasty our pants nasty uh, i don't know if we were wearing shorts or not she she said, y'all are going to stand there, and I'm getting the hose out, and she was not I happy. knew there was going to be a variation on that. <laughs> yeah. I've gotten that from my grandmother numerous times over the oh, years. Really? Not stepping in yeah. no cow dung or anything, but the stand in the carport while I get the hose, <laughs> that speech. Hey, but you know, that's the good thing about growing up up here in North Georgia, was that we we, 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 didn't, we didn't grow up in the city, right? We we actually got dirty. We, 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 you know, we ate dirt and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. We weren't... Uh, yeah, I mean... That's what I had for breakfast this morning, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Country life. Country life. Big bowl of dirt. Country life. So that, so we got washed down, and we were finally forgiven, I think, by Grandma. But um, 
<clears throat> but that leads me on to talk a little up bit. Up to your waist. Up to our waist. Well, we were so short, I guess. You know, we're only seven to eight, and that, that thing was, I, maybe I'm exaggerating, but the mud puddle that we got into, it was like a little mini, uh, I don't know, mud uh, sand. What is that? The, the sand, the sinking did you sand? Tell, was kind of, did you tell that story to your uh, wife on y'all's first date? No, I didn't. Not the first one. But you'll tell it on the air. Yeah, I'll tell it on the air. <laughs> There's some things you can't, you have to tell on the air. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want to gross people out, but uh, I hope that didn't. Uh, had, a funny little anecdote. Yeah, a funny little anecdote to lead us on a cold November morning. <laughs> exactly to lead us into that discussion on you know not stepping in manure because it'll grow it'll grow your toes. It's so good. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what is inside of manure. What is manure made of? Well, obviously we know where it comes from. <laughs> we know that it is. Um, you know, made primarily by grasses and seeds and, and nuts, perhaps things that uh, animals are consuming. Now, there are certain kinds of manure you'd want to use in the landscape. You do not want to use things like cow manure. You don't want to use domesticated animal manure like uh, cat, cats and dogs. Definitely not that. And obviously not human manure. But um, <laughs> you do want to use things like uh, horse and, and cow um, and chicken, chicken manure as well. And so whether these animals have been eating grains or grasses, um, either one can produce wonderful manure for the landscape. You know, um, uh, an old, old-time old agri- agriculturalist, a horticulturalist, his name was Liberty Hyde Bailey. Uh, he was from like Cornell up in that area. But um, anyhow, he said that a farm is not really a farm unless you have both plant life and animal life because it's a cycle. The uh, the plants feed the animals and then the animals with their manure feed the plants. And so it's a way to cycle nutrients um, and make sure that you're getting slow release uh, nitrogen to these plants. And that is one of the things that you'll find in manure is nitrogen. Nitrogen is uh, probably about three to five percent depending on what the animal has eaten and what kind of animal it is, et cetera, et cetera, and the time of year. But uh, so low nitrogen, but still it's a slow release. There is an organic form, which is the slow release, but there's also an, or, an inorganic form of nitrogen, which is a faster release, very similar to what our commercial fertilizers would be. The trouble with that inorganic form, though, is that it's very likely that it will volatilize. Volatilize means it goes from the ground directly into the air. So what you want to do with most manures is it would benefit you to uh, mix it, incorporate it is the word we use in agriculture, incorporate the manure into the soil, and that will reduce the amount of volatilization or the releasing of nitrogen from the soil directly into the air. You can lose a lot of nitrogen that way, and you don't want to uh, to do that. So definitely be sure that you um, use manure for that reason. Uh, for nitrogen, but it also contains a good a good bit of phosphorus and potassium. Now, mostly the phosphorus and potassium in the manure are strictly inorganic, uh, which means that they're very similar to our commercial fertilizers. And unless you need certain amounts of phosphorus and potassium, you can over apply too much phosphorus and cause problems in our waterways and in our streams. So you definitely want to be careful with that, especially since most of the um, uh, phosphorus in manure is going to be in organic. Now, secondly, or thirdly, uh, there are a lot of micronutrients. It's very important to have micronutrients. These micronutrients are nutrients that plants do not use a lot of, but that are essential for their growth. For instance, things like calcium and magnesium, sulfur, those kinds of things are found in manure. Of course, depending on the type of manure or, um, the, the, like I said, the time of year, the level or the amount that is found in there could be con- uh, drastically different. However, what's interesting to keep in mind is that calcium and magnesium, they help to lime your soil. If you've ever put lime on your soil, you're probably using um, uh, whether it may be, may be dolomite lime which has calcium and magnesium or maybe just a a lime that has calcium in it but you can get a similar effect maybe not as quickly or as a high of a rate but you can also help to keep your pH balanced by using manure another aspect of manure that is awesome for your landscape is organic matter the organic matter which is the 
sorry, Buster, but the mm-hmm. undigested feed <laughs> and the bacteria that's found in this uh, manure is going to help uh, filter water through the soil. It, it helps hold on to water at the same time. It helps to keep nutrients in the soil. It reduces um, erosion by wind blowing. If you just have a very high mineral-based soil or clay soil, it gets dry in the summer. Wind comes through. It can blow the soil away. Water can just erode your soil. be a very, very terrible situation. But manure helps to hold all of that together. As a matter of fact, organic matter that's found in manure can is like a little sticky substrate. It's a nice little sticky substrate, and it will hold the soil together kind of like a nice moist cake. You know how when you have a nice moist cake and it kind of crumbles, but it makes these nice, we call them aggregates. We call them aggregates. Now, Buster's shaking his head because he's probably thinking I'm, I'm alluding to a... Why a, do you <laughs> have to make the connection to manure and food? <laughs> Because as a hor- I've got to eat several other times <laughs> today. Right. Well, as a horticulturalist, manure is essential for producing food, Buster. It really is. I know everything's everything with you science type <laughs> folks, but come on now. Yeah, no, no. So I don't want to gross anybody out, but it's true. By doing this in your in your vegetable garden, by doing it even in your ornamental beds, if you're going to plant bulbs this year, which you need to do, by the way, pretty soon, if you're going to plant uh, you know daffodils and whatnot and tulips, but you can incorporate it into these beds and they can make this beautiful display and also high production of tomatoes and cucumbers and green beans, whatever it is you plan to use next year. But it does, uh, manure gives us so many uh, benefits, so many benefits. It, it, it also helps to establish benefits beneficial organisms like uh, bacteria and, and good fungal uh, that good fungus that uh, helps to uh, build good strong root systems all of these things are increased let me tell you what listen here's the thing it's hard to say how much benefit this organic matter does to the soil but the reality is what we do know is this when you um, use organic matter you are building the quality of your soil. When you're using manure, you're building the quality of the soil. And that is strongly associated with increased yields. And also, if you're selling, if, if you're a, a going to market with your products, it's going to increase your economic value as well, your economic returns. So the reality is, the reality is, organic matter is wonderful to add to the soil. Now, you know that I tell you when you're planting a tree or shrub not to do that, but you can slowly do that by applying things on top of the soil. That is extremely appropriate, and it would be recommended. Now, there is another note on manure. Not all manures are the same, and this is something that I learned early on. Um, We were planning on doing a little vegetable garden, and we wanted to use some uh, composted uh, straw. It wasn't exactly manure, but it was composted straw out of a field that cows would eat, okay? Okay. And we found out later that the individual grown, this is not uncommon, not uncommon, but the individual, the farmer who was growing this crop, had used a product called Grazon. Now, Grazon has a chemical in it which um, kills broadleaf weeds but uh, but does not hurt the grass. So that's why it's great. It's great if you're growing pasture grasses because it will eliminate weedy things like thistle and um, amaranth or whatever. But it also does not damage the grass, which is great. But here's a problem. The uh, individual cow that consumes it, it will not break down. That chemical does not break down in its gut, and it will excrete it into the manure. So when you use that manure, it lasts and it stays. And if you apply it to a vegetable bed, guess what, folks? Those poor vegetables, they won't make it. They will become eliminated. So you got to make sure that if you're using manure from another person, from somebody else's property, somebody else's farm, you really need to ask, has this been treated with, as a matter of fact, just ask him, has this been treated with anything? And if so, what has it been treated with? And before you apply it to your broadleaf uh, vegetable garden, including cucumbers and and, uh, uh, green beans or whatever, before you do that, make sure you know what's in that manure. Not all manures are alike. But that doesn't matter because we have grossed out the producer, and I hope we have not grossed out you this morning with our manure talk. But, hey, there's a lot of more interesting topics to come, so hang on tight through this last break. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on 93.9 FM WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Well, we've had an interesting discussion this morning. Very interesting topic. 
probably the the lowest we could ever get as far as uh, on this show. We've talked about manure in the landscape, but I tell you what, it's wonderful stuff. It's wonderful stuff. It's beautiful stuff. As um, as somebody that's grew up in North Georgia their whole life, yeah. it might not be uh, a very appetizing smell, <laughs> but it means money. It means money. It means money for people around here. You're exactly right. It means money, especially because manure is spread across fields. Uh, and it, it's it's a wonderful rotation of nutrients, a recycling mm-hmm. of nutrients. Instead of throwing things away, the nutrients that are left behind in the cow. And you can tell what time utilized. of the year it is just based on the smell <laughs> that's, around that's here. That's very true. It's particularly in Northeast Georgia. You're right, Buster. That's true. Uh, chicken manure, of course, is another good product uh, that you can use pretty much without fear as long as it's highly decomposed. As long as it's uh, composted, it's gone through a heat in the summer. Um, the center of the uh, pile has really heated up, um, el- eliminating fresh growth and uh, decomposing old growth. You can use cow manure without, I mean, cow, but chicken manure uh, pretty much without concern. Uh, the chicken industry uh, doesn't use the, quite the chemical like you would talk about with um, pasture-raised uh uh, straw and whatnot. But um, this morning, there's also some things that we need to think about. If we're going to be adding to the landscape, we need to be removing some things from the landscape. What do I mean by that? Well, folks, what I'm talking about is we want to help prevent disease in the landscape, particularly on things like pears, uh, whether it's ornamental pears or pear or you know fruits in general, uh, roses, crab apple trees. These kinds of plants are really susceptible to black spots and other type of disease that can overwinter in the mulch below, down in the leaves below. The leaves on the trees are pretty much falling off. Uh, we have a notice at the nursery. I don't know if, if you... Um if you have uh, uh, some some fruit trees and, and if you have some things there um, that... Sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied. If you have some fruit trees that have f- dropped their leaves, we need to rake those away. We need to rake those leaves away and we need to rake any mulch that's underneath them away. And we really need to remove that from the property or at least try to just compost it, um, particularly tr- try to put it in maybe the woods or somewhere where uh, your other good plants are not. And we want to replace it with fresh, clean mulch. Because as I've already mentioned, disease can linger on those uh, leaves. They can build up in the mulch below. And then you're left with splashing uh, onto the plant next year. And that splashing from down below from, you know, rain or irrigation or water uh, will cause more disease for the next year. So we would call this a preventative measure for reducing the amount of disease in the landscape. And you definitely need to be doing that with those plants that you noticed were a bit spotty and maybe just never looked all that healthy. You can remove the mulch as a preventative uh, for disease. Another thing that we need to be doing, probably this weekend, if you haven't already, you need to fertilize your pansies, your snapdragons, uh, cabbages, all these winter annuals that are looking really hot right now. Go ahead and use a slow-release fertilizer, something that's going to last uh, at least a few weeks. Um, And you can stop by the nursery at Lanier Nursery and Gardens where where I operate uh, down in Flowery Branch, Georgia. We have a nursery special uh, product, uh, which is basically what we use in the land in, in, in our nursery. It's a good slow release with macro and micronutrients. We've already talked about those today. Uh, but you can always use a liquid feed. If you need to use a liquid feed to, to water in, you can supplement with that. But a good slow release fertilizer is going to bring about really good growth over the next few weeks. And you're going to have a wonderful show because... Thanksgiving is just around the corner. So as you're getting ready to make that turkey look beautiful and uh, roasted, you want to make the landscape look great, too, for all of your family and visitors. So with that being said, if you haven't planted pansies or snapdragons or any of these other wonderful winter annuals, you need to do that. You need to do that. I just checked the temperature of the soil this morning. It's about 50 uh, 50 plus degrees in the soil. Folks, that is the ideal time to plant pansies and other snapdragons, things like the other winter annuals. So you definitely um, need to be sure, be sure to send us, not send us, but be sure to plant your pansies. And we have plenty at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. If you want to come down, come down and visit us um, in Flowery Branch, Georgia. Now, last, uh, last week or so, we talked a little bit about lawn care. And we were talking about the warm season grasses, and pretty much that's over. If you've done your last cutting, um, that's great. If you haven't, be sure to cut about a half inch taller than you normally would just to keep a little bit of protection on that Bermuda and also that, um, uh, that, that zoysia. 
Now, if you're using fescue, though, of course, it's a winter grass. Uh, it's a cool season grass, and the cool season grasses are um, growing over the winter. They're still warm enough now that they'll continue to grow, and maybe you've already established from seed a nice fescue lawn. If so, there's a few things you want to do. You want to make sure that, as painful as it is, is one of my least favorite jobs in the landscape, but you want to make sure you're blowing your leaves regularly. If you don't blow your leaves regularly, you're getting a thick layer of mulch on top of your baby plants, and that's not a good situation because you can cause disease, cause rot. It can cause moisture building up there right at the crown of the, of the roots and causing some damage. Uh, of course, the plants need air and they need light in order to do well. <clears throat> so be sure that you're blowing your leaves regularly. It may be every week or so or every few days, depending on how many leaves you have. Now, another thing would be acorn removal. We have that problem at the nursery. We have to remove a lot of acorns, try to get them into the areas where they can do their own thing. If you don't, they can, of course, become uh, oak trees. So acorns, if you have a lot of oak trees, you want to try to remove those at the same time as removing um, your leaves. Now, thirdly, for your fescue lawn, you can also fertilize. We're going to fertilize our pansies, right? We're going to also fertilize our fescue lawns. Our fescue lawns, um, you've, you've probably already done them at least once, and that's great. If not, you need to do them again. Do them again now, pretty soon, in the next week or two. And you can hold off because the plants won't grow as much and they won't need as much. But you can hold off until February and then again in April. So that would be a fescue lawn. You want to do it again in February and April, but go ahead and do it now. And the reality is uh, you're going to see a decrease in growth uh, as we get into these really cold months. But once we get out of the dead of winter and February starts bringing some normal temperatures hopefully uh, you'll see that fescue just kicking back up and you'll probably have you'll probably have one of the the most delightful looking lawns uh, come early spring so um, that would be lawn care and uh, lawn is not my favorite discussion I'm still going to throw in what I would like to say about lawn is that it's high maintenance. Um, lawn takes up a lot of time, takes up a lot of resources, it takes up a lot of water, it takes up a lot of uh, your time as far as mowing it, blowing the leaves off of it, uh, uh, aerating it, uh, all of these things you have to do to a lawn. Whereas I think you should be planting trees and shrubs. I think you should be planting trees and shrubs because they are beautiful. And they are delightful. And you don't have to prune them, but maybe every few years, some maybe once a year. But with a lawn, you're pruning every week, essentially, during the uh, growing season. So definitely, if you want a lower-maintenance landscape, you've got to use less lawn. Maybe use enough just for the kids to run out on or for the dog to uh, manure upon. <laughs> but uh, regardless, you want to reduce the amount of turf you have and uh, increase trees, shrubs, perennials annuals even and you can always find beautiful uh, trees and shrubs and, and the like at Lanier Nursery and Gardens come see me this weekend before 4 today you can come visit me in Flowery Branch again that's LanierNurseryGardens.com you can come visit me there uh, just a quick reminder about bulbs I know that I mentioned bulbs earlier and I think it's about time to mention them once again Bulbs, if you're going to plant spring bulbs, you need to do that pretty quickly, folks. You've got to do it pretty quickly. What you want to do is you want to, number one, create a nice soft bed for the bulbs. Softening the soil, tilling the soil, using a cultivator, a hand cultivator, a shovel even, a fork, whatever it may be, a, a digging fork. Using these things, creating a nice bed is going to be awesome. And also you want to incorporate organic matter. Of course, we are talking about manure, but you can use compost as well. You can use uh, mushroom compost, whatever your heart desires. We have plenty of soil amendments to choose from at the nursery. Uh, so definitely you want to create a nice fluffy bed with organic matter. Now, the question we always get with bulbs is how deep do we plant them? How deep do we plant our bulbs? Well, we plant them two to three times the width of the bulb. Go ahead and write that down. If you're planting daffodils, if you're planting crocus, if you're planting planting um, tulips, go ahead and measure. Maybe they're two inches thick. If they're a nice two-inch bulb, well, you're going to want to plant it four to six inches underground. So that's, again, two to three times the width of the bulb. That's how deep you want to plant them. Now, yes, it's true that there is a bottom of the bulb and there's a top of the bulb. Some bulbs are easier to identify the bottoms than others, but uh, usually that basal, that root plate down at the base, you want to plant that in the bottom of the hole. Now, you don't have to do that because the plant... Uh, 
the bulb, the, the tulip or whatever it is you're planting, is actually created in such a way, not, not programmed, but created in such a way, uh, that it will rotate itself. If you plant it upside down, it will rotate itself underground. The roots will take hold and start pulling the tip towards, um, towards the sky. And then you get a great uh, top growth there. Um, so, but if you want to encourage that and increase uh, the the quicker emergence of these bulbs, be sure to locate the bulb plate. It'll be right there on the bottom, and you can place that in the bottom of the hole. Lastly, you want to fertilize. Give your bulbs a nice fertilizer. Of course, a slow release like we use at the nursery at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Uh, that would be highly recommended. It will actually start to kick in soon because. The sooner you get your bulbs in the ground, the sooner their roots will take on. And that is the same for trees and shrubs. If you plant a containerized plant that, like we grow at the nursery, you will be able to get a great, fabulous root system established. So you've got to get out this weekend, folks. You've got to get out and do something. I know as I look at the temperature, it's 40 degrees. That's not so bad. Tonight, though, it's supposed to be lower in the 29s or so. So definitely 40 degrees right now. Not so bad. Put on a light coat, maybe a heavy coat if you're prone to a, a winter chill. And get out there and do some digging, do some cultivating. And if you want to plant some stuff, come and see me this weekend at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch, Georgia. Uh, if you want to find out how to get there, just visit our website at LanierNurseryGardens.com. And of course, I want to make sure that you're listening to our program every week. So be sure to go to Facebook uh, before this hour is over. Go to Facebook and search WRWH. Go to YouTube, search WRWH, and you can get connected with us. You can send us messages. Send us a message at info at wrwh.com we'll be glad to answer it live on the air we'll be glad to answer that live on the air we've got a lot more to come this winter folks we're not going anywhere we know gardening is not over in the winter time it's just beginning we're going to talk about planting we're going to talk uh, not planting but planning uh, this winter so you've got to hang on with us this winter and yes it's a good time to have a cup of coffee um, a nice biscuit or whatever and you can join us for a lot of fun this weekend I mean uh, every weekend Saturday at 9 a.m. folks Folks, I'm out of here. We'll see you later. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.